Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. So this is the weekly chart of silver, and I've drawn a number of indicators on here. The first one is the MACD, of course, and the bottom indicator is the volume. So there's a couple things I want to point out with this chart. The first thing, of course, is this short-term trend line that we're looking at here that you can see we've clearly broken down from and that matches a MACD downtrend. Now I said a while back that I don't think the bottom is in at 1710 I think is what we hit. We had a smackdown recently. Uh, the MACD is definitely pointing to the downside. How much more downside is due? I don't think too much really and I'm going to show you why here. So I want to show you the importance of this volume indicator here. But first, let's look at these trend lines starting with the, I could probably draw one from the very top as well. But looking at the trend lines coming from the top that we put in in 2011, you can see that silver is basically on a trend to go to zero. You can see that uh, sometime based on this trend line, some if it would have continued sometime in 2017 the price of silver would have hit zero and we know that's impossible the next trend line would have put it out maybe a year and maybe six more months but this trend had to reverse because silver can't go to zero so silver pretty much corrected back to the bear stearns top and is backing and filling all the way in this area here trying to find some type of support uh, and that's probably the area where it's going to bottom. But the most important thing is going to be this volume here. You can see I drew an arrow down to the volume spike, this little tiny spike. You can see it's starting right there. And that volume spike started with QE2 and this massive move up in the price of silver. Now, relatively, th that amount of volume was nothing. You can see that silver moved from $17.50 to nearly $50 on uh, nothing compared to what we have today. So what's going on? Why do we see the volume just go up exponentially uh, through this time period? Well, this is the beginning of the increase in the trading of paper contracts. So the volume that you're looking at is the volume of paper silver. So you could also think of it in terms of the percentage of trading that is virtual versus the percentage of trading that is real. So if you did some type of analysis, I let's get to this top here. Uh, about 4 million there and you can see we're up at 125 million now so that's a factor of 25 we'll say we've increased the percentage of paper silver to real silver in trading by a factor of 25 so we're probably really only trading about 1% now maybe even much less maybe 0.1% uh, what is being traded back and forth now in the silver market is paper. And they've had to increase the amount of paper trading that they've done as they push the price down. And you can see that as the price kind of bottomed and is now rounding over, that it's still increasing. So as long as this trend continues, this increased volume of paper trading continues, we will probably see suppression continue. But uh, if, if we see this begin to taper off, I suspect that they're probably gonna let the price go. This can only go on for so long, and we just don't know how long that can be. But uh, based on this chart, I would say that in the intermediate term, we're looking at lower prices for silver. That's a great thing for stackers. I really don't think that silver is going to take out the majority of this area. So 15 is going to be 15 or a little bit below is probably going to be the price floor that we're talking about here, although we're expecting some downside at this point. 
Now, I wanted to talk about the Philippines and what I think is a pivot that is occurring, a change that is occurring in the Philippines. I'm going to start with this article from CNN, and this just broke tonight, but this thing has been heating up for quite some time here, and there have been some very, uh, there's been a series of statements that amount to very fiery rhetoric coming from this president, uh, Duterte, uh, out of the Philippines. But let me read this, and I'm going to analyze the economic numbers here. Washington, Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte's surprise announcement of a military and economic separation from the U.S. during a visit to Beijing Thursday left the Obama administration scrambling as it raised questions about the U.S.'s role in the region and threatened a realignment of U.S. relationships in Asia. Duterte's Declaration is the latest indication that the Philippines president, just five months into his six-year term, intends to reshape his country's ties to its closest ally by doubling down on his pivot away from the U.S. and toward China. America has lost now, Duterte said at a business forum Thursday during a four-day state visit to Beijing. Quote, I've realigned myself in your ideological flow and maybe I will also go to Russia to talk to Putin and tell him that there are three of us against the world, China, Philippines, and Russia. It's the only way, end quote. Duterte's comments risk disrupting, disrupting not, not just U.S.-Philippine ties, but U.S. ties to the larger Asia-Pacific region, a region that Obama has made a central pillar of his foreign policy ambitions as he looks to anchor the U.S. in the Pacific century. Though the White House is trying to emphasize the positive aspects of the long-standing relationship with the Southeast Asia island country, Duterte's comments provoked a swift response from Washington. State Department spokesman John Kirby said the U.S. would seek an explanation, which the U.S. hadn't known were coming. He described them as, quote, yet another string in some pretty strong rhetoric that we think we believe is at odds with the kind of relationship that we've had and continue to have with the Filipino people. Duterte detailed exactly the kind of separation he had in mind Thursday in Beijing, saying, quote, I announced my separation from the United States, both in military not maybe social, but economics also. In an apparent attempt at damage control, Philippine Trade Minister Ramon Lopez said Friday that his country will maintain trade and econ economic ties with the U.S. So this has been heating up for some time, and I want to examine the economics of it. But before I do that, I just want to examine ge the geography of this situation. So this is Google Earth course you know that I don't believe this well there hello there's the galaxy back there but <laughs> you know I don't believe that this is an accurate map of the world we'll just leave it at that but just looking at the map itself you can see here's the Philippines here's Taiwan here's uh, Vietnam Cambodia Thailand and then China here we've got Japan up here Korea now we know that Korea, Japan, Taiwan, uh, these are all economic powerhouses. The Philippines, on the other hand, is kind of like a, a distant cousin to these. And you can see what's interesting about this is the proximity of the Philippines to Taiwan. Uh, the, we're talking about 500 miles between these two islands, less than 500 miles between these two islands. So I can't imagine that there is a big racial uh, or uh, demographic difference between the two. I could be wrong, but I suspect that Taiwan and the Philippines have a lot more in common than the Philippines and let's go all the way over here to the United States. So th the real question is why would the Philippines align itself with the United States rather than China. And let's look at some of the numbers here. Now, if you remember my interview that I had recently 
uh, with Dunnigan on uh, reluctant preppers. Uh, I just want to explain to people there were a number of criticisms in the comments. Uh, when I do interviews with people like Dunnigan or um, anybody else, Elijah or SGT Report, when I do those interviews, oftentimes they will offer me a list of questions that that they want me to screen or they will offer for me to submit questions that they want me uh, that I want them to ask and I, I never do that so basically when I have an interview with one of these people uh, they just pull out questions from their viewers or they just make up questions on the fly I don't know what the questions are going to be ahead of time so what happened with Dunnigan was that the thing ended up being mostly about China and uh, that's fine by me I've had the same position for a very long time that China is the up-and-coming power uh, that China is rising the US is declining and I tried uh, hopefully to counter the arguments that that China is dumping and that China is uh, operating at a loss and there's just no way to uh, make that argument but one of the factors or one of the indicators that I use in fact one of the most reliable indicators for me is this GDP per capita and the reason why is because it's not just GDP but it's it's GDP per citizen it factors in population growth as well as GDP growth now I am more likely to believe GDP figures coming out of Asia than I am to believe them coming out of the West because the West is now um, just filled with liars from top to bottom whether it's Britain the United States Canada so I think probably the numbers coming out of the out of Asia are more accurate in regards to GDP I don't think our GDP is as good as it is represented here but you can see even if we take it at face value US GDP per capita is hovering around that 500 mark and it has for some time long before the financial crisis where it dropped below it and is now just barely recovering now this mark is a percentage that's how it works on this chart it's a percentage of the world's average so you can see that basically the United States is four to five times wealthier per capita than the average of the rest of the world so keep that in mind when we look at the rest of these countries so let's go ahead and look at some other countries we want to look at the euro area and we want to look at their GDP per capita I'm sorry that uh, was the wrong one here give me a second here so the uh, euro area GDP per capita and you can see that theirs comes in a little bit less than the US around the 400 mark uh, 400 percent of world average but you can see that that Europe is pretty much stagnated at the same point the US has uh, right before the financial crisis or so it uh, flatlined and hasn't increased um, next one we want to look at is Japan and uh, the same sort of thing is happening in Japan uh, you can really only increase GDP so much and then what's going to happen is the trade is going to flow somewhere else so you can see now we know that Japan actually was the first to enter into the stagnant growth that happened with the crash of their stock market back in 1990 and you can see that since that crash GDP per capita was close to 400 it's risen above that but it's really only gone to 450 so uh, over the course of 30 years or so Japan has really only increased its GDP per capita about 10 percent now on the other hand let's take a look at China and look at their GDP per capita growth and you can see that uh, since 1990 what we were looking at with Japan that they've risen over 600 percent and for the same period that we have the US and Europe uh, we, we're talking about a 300 plus percent increase now again they're only around 60 so you can see that GDP per capita 
China is still below the world's average. Now that doesn't mean that they're not wealthy. They're tremendously wealthy because you have to remember that China has a billion people. But per capita, they're still below the world's average. Now let's take a look at the Philippines and I'm going to show you why I believe it's in the Philippines' interest to align themselves with China, not just because of geography, but also because of trade. And you can see here their GDP per capita is on a similar growth curve. It's certainly not at the same growth rate. Uh, it hasn't even doubled, but it is on an upward trend. So the big question is, is it in the Philippines' interest to align themselves with China, or is it in their interest to align themselves with or continue to be aligned with the United States? Well, the first question I would ask is, just looking at this chart, would you say, based on this chart, that the Philippines have, the Filipino people have benefited from their alignment with the United States? You can see that back in 1980, they were roughly at 17 to 18 percent of the world's uh, GDP per capita, and a good uh, 35 years later, uh, they're only at 25 percent. Have the Filipino people really benefited from being aligned with the United States? Uh, have they performed more like the United States in GDP per capita or have they performed more like China? I would say they've performed so far more like the United States, although they're beginning to tick up. So let's take a look at their trade deficit. Now you can see here on their balance of trade that the Philippines have uh, set a record in trade deficit. Now, their currency is loosely tied to the U.S. dollar. Uh, they seem to be importing a tremendous amount of things. You can see here, I'll, I'll let you read the summary yourself. But you can see that their trade situation is just getting worse and worse and worse. Now, there's no reason that should be the case, considering that they are this close geographically to China. So it makes perfect sense that the Philippines would begin to pivot towards China. Now, if you remember when the United States introduced the Monroe Doctrine over a century ago, where the United States said that foreign powers involved in this area here, our sphere of influence, would be met with military force, uh, we can see that that is certainly uh, analogous to the proximity that the Philippines holds with China. I don't think that any reasonable person, regardless of what type of map they believe in, could argue that these countries, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, the Philippines, all of this southern continent with Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, even Malaysia and Singapore, and Indonesia and possibly even Australia and New Zealand. I don't think anybody can reasonably argue that these are not geographically in China's area of influence. So this is very important going forward. It's clear to me that the Philippines now, and I believe this is going to be one of many dominoes, are beginning to pivot towards China and that is uh, an indication of the rise of Chinese economic power the decline of U.S. economic power, which is going to decline for quite some time. And uh, this is just going to be more, more of the same going forward. And we'll talk to you next time.